Uh, Rockefeller International Chairman Rushir Sharma joins us today with his 2023 Investor Guide and joins us this morning. It's great to have you back. Uh, I wonder, before we get to your, your playbook, what you make of the setup so far in these early days, meaning uh, wage growth appears to be softening, some recession calls in Europe being lifted, China reopening, commodities down for the year. I mean, it's, it, it's, people argue it sounds Goldilocks. Does it make sense? But I think it does in some extent in that the uh, consensus, uh, as even argued in my piece, that there's never been a time in history where economists have accurately forecast a recession. As you know, that in fact, if all the recessions in post-World War II history, economists have a track record of having never called one. And yet, we got to a point late last year where a majority of economists for the first time in history were calling for a recession. So there's potential for an upside surprise as far as economic growth is concerned. And the rest of the world is delivering that. Europe is delivering that. Uh, some of the Asian markets are delivering that. The U.S. is softening, but the rest of the world, the growth has been surprising a bit on the upside. You talk about uh, the dollar, and we're, I still remember DXY 114, uh, 10 points below. Uh, talk about why that's important to watch and what it says about the U.S. and the rest of the world. You know, the dollars, uh, as we spoke last time when we were on air together, uh, and that was really a, the crescendo of the dollar up move, um, back in uh, fall, that, that really, I think, marked a climactic top. As happens with most big trends, you get this climax where everyone gets very bullish, can only see upside in the currency, and the dollar has already been in a bull market for over a decade. That's the longest bull market in the U.S. dollar ever since it became a freely floating exchange rate in the 1970s. So I think a dollar downturn was overdue. It has begun. The dollar seems to have peaked. And that has very important uh, implications, I think, for international markets, that typically emerging markets, international markets, tend to outperform when the dollar is weakening. And that's the playbook we have seen. And I expect much more of that this year and in the coming years. I think that this is a multi-year dollar downtrend that has just begun. There'll be a lot of hesitancy in the beginning. Uh, but these trends tend to last five to seven years. And we are possibly just in the first innings of this. Is that why you also believe sort of in the rise of what you call the rest of the world? Yeah, uh, as I've been emphasizing that this massive disconnect has opened up in the world where the U.S. economy is 25 percent of the global economy. And yet the U.S. stock market comprises more than 60 percent of the global MSCI index. That's never happened before. The gap has never been that large. The U.S. has always been the world's dominant capital market but never had yet an instance where the U.S. has been so far above its economic weight in the global economy. So I think that it's time for international allocations. It was a terrible decade for international investing um, since 2008, really. Uh, but now I think the tide is turned. And yes, the dollar's uh, decline is a very important part of that declining trend of uh, allocations towards the U.S. So that, I think, is the really major shift for capital allocators of going international, seeking out emerging markets again after a dead decade for them the last uh, few years. So taking that, Rushir, taking uh, the debate that we're seeing play out on our air on a daily basis about what chapter we're in in terms of this bear market right now here in uh, U.S. equities, how does that speak to what history shows us and tells us about echo bubbles, for example? Yeah, so the concept of echo bubbles really is the fact that once that, even though we think in broader terms that once a bubble bursts, uh, it's the end of it, uh, what history teaches us, including in the NASDAQ bubble burst of 2000 and then the commodities bubble burst of uh, 2010, 11 onwards, that bubbles don't burst in a straight line, in fact. You, you get a big decline, but there's a lot of hope still embedded because it was such a long trend and you get these echo bubbles, what I describe as very powerful rallies of up to 50 to 60 percent that take place off the lows uh, and give false hope that the trend is still alive. Um, that's what I call an echo bubble. But those echo bubbles need to be faded. And that's what I think needs to happen with a lot of these bounces we're seeing in some of the tech stocks, in some of even the Chinese big cap tech stocks. I think all these are currently enjoying what I call an echo bubble. Uh, but just like we saw in 2001, 2002, or even a decade ago with commodities, 
that all these tend to fade after very big bounces. The leadership changes in a new bull market or once a bear market sets in. And I think that the leadership of tech, of growth, uh, of U.S. and private investing, all these big uh, bubbles of the last decade, those have burst. You'll get echo bubbles of rebounds, but those all need to be faded as the leadership moves towards international, industrials, commodities. That's where I think the new leadership is building. Yeah, that's interesting. I'm actually really interested in your, your view that there will be structural churn in large tech, the players within large tech, uh, and that a lot of it will be industrial. But, you know, for example, today, uh, so much discussion about open AI and Microsoft's investment. I mean, that has, that has severe co consumer consequences. Yes, it does. But the point here is this, that if you look at the big uh, tech winners of the last tech bull market of the late 1990s, um, just like at the start of this decade, of the top 10 companies in the world, a majority of those were tech companies back then. The only real survivor after that, which continued to be in the top 10, uh, was Microsoft. All the other big tech winners of that decade, uh, Cisco, IBM, Nokia, NTT Docomo, around the world, all those faded into oblivion. And I think that's the true nature of capitalism, and even more so in tech, that there's a lot of mortality. And once you reach such an elevated level, some new business model comes in, some new technology comes in and takes over. So therefore, I suspect that the big cap tech still has a lot more to fall over the next few years or at least underperform. Uh, and maybe there'll be one or two survivors. But of the 10 uh, leading companies in the world at the start of this decade, history suggests that only one or maybe two will still be in that top 10 by the end of this decade. So massive churn waiting to happen still. Yeah, some of us are old enough to remember some of the names you just mentioned, we used to talk about them all the time. <laughs> Rishir, thanks. Yes. Talk soon.